have the good uh, sense, clearness of mind to take Trenton first. Then we went on to Princeton. I was not taken on as one of their students, but I could at least be one of their liberators. <laughs> so there was that. But recognition of my own endeavors, it came in a form I had neither expected. No, I will grant initially longed for. You see, General Washington, having lost, I will say it is a bit uh, distracting having him here with me, but I, I will press on. General Washington, having lost many of his personal aides to various positions of field command, he now needed new ones, and so he requested that I join his military family. Yet again, as a clerk. I'd been a clerk before, I did not want to be one again, I wanted to lead troops in the field, but my goodness, this is General Washington we're talking about, so I accepted. I was promptly raised to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, and in this case, I suppose it would have to do. <laughs> Busy as he was, the general required us not only for dictation skills, but to think for him, as well as execute orders. We were required to learn his mind right on his behalf, making lesser decisions that would save him time and effort. Responsible as we were for the vast majority of the general's correspondences, we were kept confined from morning until evening, very few amusements to speak of. You can imagine, under such circumstances, we became a very close family, held together with zeal for the cause. I will say, working as the General's aide gave me vital experience, taught me why we needed a strong centralized government. But it was not what I wanted to do. As I said, I wanted to lead men into battle, and I told the General that repeatedly. <laughs> Finally, uh, it was after I, I married my dear wife, in fact, Miss Elizabeth Schuyler, my dear Betsy. Best of wives and best of women. You see, not a month later, I was rejoined into the general service. <clears throat> One day, not very long after that, we were, we were passing on some stairs and he turned to me and he said, uh, young man, I'd like to speak to you, if you, will, if you will let me. And I said, well, I, I actually have some business to conclude, but I will attend upon you shortly. I went, I, I made certain that that business was done with. I, I, and as I was returning to the general, I, I was stopped by the Marquis de Lafayette. He's a friend of both of ours. Uh, we spoke for about a minute. However, I had to leave, and, and I, I fear if we had not been good friends, it would have been considered quite rude, but uh, he understood the situation. When I met the general, he was still waiting upon those steps. He looked at me, a bit like that, I mean a bit more severe <laughs> than that. Uh, you've seen portraits of him, you know how severe he can get. He looked at me and he said, young man, you have kept me waiting here some 10 minutes. I must say, you treat me with disrespect. Well, this is not the first outburst I've ever heard from the general, but you can imagine it starts to wear a bit thin. So I told him, with decision, by the way, without petulancy, I said, oh, I was not aware of it, sir, but since you find the need to tell me so, then we ought to part. He said, with some amazement, very well, sir, if you wish it. I said, I do. By the way, it should be noted the time that I spent from the general had not lasted two minutes. The great man, to his credit, reconsidered. He apologized, he requested my return. I refused. <laughs> no, I would not return but for a field position. Finally, I got my wish. I was to lead the American assault at Yorktown 